Well, our next speaker is a London-based political analyst and also a senior fellow with the South Asia Centre of the Atlantic Council of the US. Earlier this week, he published a report for the Legatum Institute, which concluded that Pakistan remains vulnerable to the threat of yet another army takeover and that the country has little prospect of emulating its rival and neighbour India in setting itself on the path to economic success. No Pakistani civilian government, he points out, has ever completed its term of office. Ladies and gentlemen, Jonathan Paris. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, a lot of my report was based on some of the views of our previous speakers, so you may hear a, a certain echo when I get uh, closer to the Taliban part of the speech. Uh, I want to start out, though, and give you an overview. Since my study was called Prospects for Pakistan, and that's essentially the topic of this forum, I wanted to give you a quick synopsis of what I see are the prospects for Pakistan. I, get, I had three scenarios in mind. One is pathways to success. The other is muddling through, and the, the, the third or worst case is a so-called failed state. And I think it's, um, I guess I took the middle route and said that the likelihood over the next one to three years is that Pakistan will muddle through. It will neither achieve pathways to success, either economically or politically, but it will, not, it will also not descend into a failed state. I want to just talk a little bit about the economy because we haven't really explored that here. The economy is, ha, had been doing fairly well under the Musharraf years. You can argue why, but the fact of the matter is the statistics were pretty positive. In fact, their GDP at one point during those years was higher than India. On the other hand, since the uh, last couple of years, you've seen a, a, a tailspin. And the IMF has been forced to come in and basically rescue the economy. The problem we have now with Afghanistan, with, with Pakistan, is that it's, it's on a lifeline of support from the IMF. It's fairly dependent on outside funds. It's not doing the things that attract foreign direct investment, that attract business, that, uh, that attracts trade. It's, it's, and it can't go on forever living on handouts. So what, my one prescription here is that they have to kind of break away from the IMF stranglehold and they have to break away from the dependence on funds and aid and try to move more into building up the Pakistan brand. Of course, that will require a, a much more security than you see in Pakistan today. Imran pointed out earlier today at a speech at Chatham House that the deterioration of security is just enormous right now. You have suicide bombings in all of the major cities in, uh, in, in Pakistan, some of them inside jobs within the army and some of them clearly outside jobs. Uh, so security is a problem. I also want to comment on Islamic trends. What I, see, what I see is that the idea that the Taliban or any of the Islamist parties will take over Pakistan is very unlikely. But what I do see likely is the growing influence of quasi-political, quasi-militant Islamist groups who are displeased with the state and they will slowly transform Pakistan into a country that is even less friendly to the United States and the UK, and it will be unable to act in accord with U.S. interest in the public sphere, at least, when, when the U.S. seeks that public partnership. In other words, Pakistan is drifting away from the United States. Now, I want to say something about the AFPAC, uh, the AFPAC name. This was a word that was coined some, at some point at the beginning of the Obama administration. And I find it not only offensive sounding, but I find it as, as um, a symptom of the problem that the United States has again and again done in dealing with Pakistan. And, and, and that is, in short, Pakistan, for the last 60, 50 years, has been seen as a means to another end. Pakistan was a means to help America fight the Soviet Union in the Cold War in the 1950s. Pakistan was a means to find a pathway to Mao Zedong in China by Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon in the early 1970s. Pakistan was a means to defeat the Soviets in Afghanistan in the 1980s. We've heard a lot about that. And again, after 9-11, Pakistan became the means to fight the global war of terrorism. Now, we seem to see the same thing with this AFPAC uh, idea. Pakistan has become 
the means again by which America and NATO try to stabilize, not Pakistan, but Afghanistan. There's something wrong with that. And I'll tell you what's wrong with it. From the Pakistani view, they do not see their primary mission as one of helping the U.S. make the Obama strategy work. And herein lies the tension between the United States and Pakistan. Now, I think the Obama surge has some merit to it, and I think it may work, but I think it's very important to hear what, what Anatole was saying, that Pakistan could play a role as a back channel, not this time to Mao Zedong in China, but as a back channel to the Taliban. Not the ideologically driven Taliban that are beyond the pale, but the vast majority of Taliban who could be persuaded to come back to some kind to, to the negotiating table. This will not be easy now because Pak the Taliban are on somewhat of a roll in Afghanistan. But nonetheless, I think the back channel is a good idea. Pakistan, the ISI in Pakistan, has very good long-standing relations with the Afghan Taliban. They can even train them in some diplomatic skills to make more possible reciprocity in the negotiation between the West and the Taliban. But that, I see, is the only way we can come to a solution. The fortunate thing about the United States right now is they do have a pretty good team out in, in this region. Uh, first and foremost, Stanley McChrystal, the general of the uh, NATO forces, is somebody I knew personally. He is a, a, an incredibly driven man, both intellectually, uh, uh, physically, uh, uh, and I think he knows, he understands that the key to winning this battle is not through the military force alone. It will require winning the hearts and minds of the people. Now, uh, as to the drone issue, I think I, I come out where Anatole comes out, which is if you can limit the collateral damage and stick to the areas where you are already bombing and decapitating al-Qaeda leadership and some of the senior Taliban leadership, that's fine. But if you were to expand it to the Quetta Shura, where uh, Omar Mullah uh, allegedly sits, that would be a big problem. It would be a problem uh, uh, for a variety of reasons, but basically you would lose the hearts and minds of the Pakistanis. It's much better to restrict the drones, but I do think there is a role for the drones. I have a son in the military right now in Baghdad, and what I fear most is that he will be injured by an IED. The drones at least the drones do not kill British and U.S. servicemen who on the ground get killed. And that is the problem. As fatalities increase, uh, when spring comes in Afghanistan, you're going to have increasing, increasingly domestic lack of support here and in the United States for this, for this war. So I think, again, the key is bring in the back channel, bring in the Pakistanis to create a back channel between the Afghan Taliban and the United States and NATO. Let me just skip on to uh, India for a second. I think there's a growing realization in India that if Pakistan becomes a failed state, it could prevent India from attaining its global power status. In other words, Project India depends on de-escalating military tensions, on Pakistan achieving a modicum of economic success, and on Pakistan controlling its population growth. I haven't heard anything about that yet. But Pakistan's population is growing way too fast for its economy, for its education system, for its health care system to keep up. It's a serious problem for India because overcrowded countries tend to spill over. In conclusion, I would say that Pakistan public opinion is moving rightward. It's becoming more Islamic, less tolerant. The blasphemy laws are not likely to be repealed. They are more likely to be less accommodating toward American interest and toward the West generally. America, unfortunately, is the target of Islamist rhetoric and will continue to be for the foreseeable future. There was a recent poll that showed that not India, but, Pac but America is the most hated country in Pakistan. In fact, it, the order was America number one, uh, Al-Qaeda number two, or the extremist number two, and then India. So I guess the good news in that poll is that the perception of India is improving relative to America. <laughs> But I want, to, I want to end my remarks short so I have a chance to get some extra time in the Q&A. And let me just say that if the American public is looking for a grateful Pakistani public for what America is doing in South Asia, the Americans are likely to be disappointed.